Thank you very much. Uh, I have a moon in you. The word emuna is mentioned by Abraham Avinu, and then it's mentioned by in the, at the war with Amalek. When he even were in the desert, straight out, out after the Kriyas Yamsuf, Amalek came and attacked the Eden. And Moshe told Yeshua to choose some men to go and face Amalek. Moshe himself, it says that he went up on the hill and he will pray for him and don't worry, you'll win the war. And the Torah tells us, Anybody knows what I'm talking about? Can you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Louder. Yeah. louder? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I'm in competition with this guy, you know. <laughs> the Torah tells us that Moshe Rabbeinu went up on the hill and they sure went out to fight the moment. And it says that Moshe lifted his arms skyward. When Moshe lifted his arms, then Yeshua was victorious, was overpowering over Amalek. When Moshe lowered his arms, then Yeshua was, betray, uh, betray, uh, was being defeated, was being pushed away. And Moshe, it says, Moshe, his hands were too heavy for him to hold up in that moment. Why the Moshe's hands were heavy? That's what the Torah says. They made, they Moshe, uh, I can't remember the word. They were heavy for him to hold up. So they took a stone, as it says, and Moshe sat down on the stone, on the rock, and Aaron and Hur, Aaron and Hur, held up his hands upwards from the two sides, and then it says, by he yod of emuna behashomish, and his hands were emuna till the sunset. Till sunset. They, they were emuna. They were, that's what it says, emuna. Which means they were up, steady, uh, they stretched upwards, steadily, emuna, till the sunset. And during this time, Yeshua was able to take care of Amalek, and Amalek was, was defeated. So what does the word Amunah over there mean? Amunah means steady. Right? Steadfast. And how did it come about that it was steady? When the person is holding up his own hands, he, is, he cannot be steady. He, he is constantly exerting strength, power to hold it up. It's not held up by itself. It's being, it's being forced to stay up. He has to use his 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 um, his determination to hold it up. When something is holding it up, being supported, then it can stay be steady. It's not dependent on his activity. Since he is sure and and um, um, sorry, Aaron and Hur were holding up Moshe's hands. It wasn't dependent on Moshe's own effort. This is why it was, they had a, a you know, for a moon, it was steady. And because of that, he was able to hold his instant. So the word emuno actually denotes an element of steadiness. Now, in the human being, nothing is steady. Everything he's aware of by learning about it, thinking about it, when he thinks about it, it's there. When he doesn't think about it, it's not there. The most steady element in a person's experience is sight. When you hear things, the sound comes piecemeal. Sight, you, you could focus and see an object without any interruption, steadily. 
That's the most steady element in terms of a person's experience. But in sight also, it is not really steady because you have to keep your eyes open. You have to stay focused. It is not something that is there automatically. So therefore it is not steady. It is a constant activity on the part of a person to keep focused, keep looking at the object. Therefore, if we say that in a person there is a muna, so if we say, I, I know about Hashem, I know about Hashem intellectually, and I understand it very well, that cannot be steady. Because it is there when you're thinking about it. When you don't think about it, then it's not there. Thank you. Then, Anytime you want to think about it, you'll be able to bring it up. It makes a difference, but, but, the, but the thought of it is not steady. So it's not a moon. A moon, we say, is something that is constant. How can that be? What is the faculty that allows a person to have something steady? Excuse me? Yes, what does it mean? Huh? Yes, what is steady? I'm sorry? Yeah, oh, you want to study it. Very good. Please ask. Who knows? Who can translate study? Huh? Pastayadi. Yeah, constantly. Without any need of support. It's just there. Mm-hmm. How can anything in human experience, you understand every word now? Mm-hmm. Be steady. Human experience is always renewed. It's constantly being created, active. Like I said, you think of something, so it's, it's clear, but you have to think about it. If you don't think about it, then it vanishes. If we say that there is something in a person that's a moon or that's steady, that means, uh, shucks, this is also a steady nuisance. So, how can it be steady? So, just as in the case of Moshe Rabbeinu's hands, Videy Moshe Kvedim, that's the word, unfortunately, Moshe's hands were heavy. I couldn't hold up. That's just in case of Moshe's hands. What made them steady? The fact that someone else was holding them up. It wasn't through Moshe's own effort. Same is true in the union of a muna in every heat. What makes possible that there should be a steady in a, a muna in a person is the fact that Hashem is holding him up. This is not something that he has on his own. This is something that is provided for him for him directly from Hashem, from his Mishan. It is being it is not something that one can contemplate, contemplate intellectually. It's not an intellectual kind of thing because intellectually has to be constantly rejuvenated, recreated, rethought, which is steady. There is an element in us that is literally steady, constant and moving. It is so steady, the Alter Rebbe says, that even when a person, while a person, Chas is doing a sin, that a muna remains, remains steady, untouched. Because this is not something which is dependent on him. It's not dependent on his faculties. This is something which is provided for him from a high, from the labor from Hashem. Therefore, knowing that we have this constant support from Hashem, no matter what is going on in our lives, we should always be able to smile. Did you hear that? <laughs> I smile on you. 
Um, all right. So, um, we usually, in this general class, we speak on the Pasha of the Week. Today is Gimel Thomas, a very, very significant day, a challenging day, challenging, what challenging means? A difficult day to, to relate to, to overcome. It challenges our steadiness. And the Pasha of the week, Bolok, is actually very reinforcing, very um, supportive of this Amuna element. Those of you who did not learn the Pasha last year, you'll get to it this year, Mitzvah Hashem. But as you will see, this Pasha is, is a tremendously profound significance. Where Bilam, you start away you're learning Bilam, was called by Bolok to, to give a curse to the Jewish people. And instead of cursing them, he bestowed the biggest blessings upon them. And the biggest amongst the blessings were his nevuah, his prophecy of ultimately their stand, coming up, David Hamelech, who was the first Mashiach, as the Rambam says, the, not David Hamelech, and ultimately Mashiach. It's all included in this passion. So I said, this Pasha coming on Gimel Thomas, it's very, it's, it's a very helpful Pasha for Gimel Thomas. There's a big emphasis in this Pasha, as I said, on the principle of a melech, of a king, in the Jewish people. Gimel Tamas, likewise, is something that to us speaks of the, of the principle of a king. And it's interesting that by the free Rebbe, by the previous Rebbe, you know that the previous Rebbe also has a special day on Gimel Tammuz. I'm sure you heard about this. Gimel Tammuz was a day that the previous Rebbe's life was spared. Even though he continued to be in exile, in Silke, but, he, but his life was spared, he was released from the prison. What? In exile, yes, they could come to him. But it was very far. Yes, in exile, the, the, the rule over there in exile, depend, depending which, there are different kinds of silk, different kinds of exiles. The Russians were, were uh, really creative in terms of torturing people. And uh, someone, sometimes they send somebody away for years of hard labor. The Rebbe was not assigned to hard labor, but he was assigned to exile, to be 
away from his family, from this place. Um, so the Rebbe, our Rebbe one time explained that the, the previous Rebbe had declared the day of Yud Beis Yud Gimel Tamus a week later, ten days later, when he was actually released and allowed to go home, that day he, he declared as a holiday, the, 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 the day of redemption. But the day of Gimel Tamus, he did not declare it as a holiday. And the Rebbe explained why not. He was spared, his life was spared. And the answer that the Rebbe gave was because Gimel Thomas was a personal salvation. His life was spared, but he was still not able to communicate and to teach Chesidus and to guide Chesidus. And therefore, in terms of, of the general, his general function, his general mission of guiding the Jewish people and guiding the Chesidus, he was still not released, he's still not capable of doing it. Therefore, to him, this, this is not a day of redemption. He was still in, in exile and still in prison, technically speaking. But, so, because Gimel Thomas is just a personal, for him personally it meant something, but it's not something which is for general value. That's why the Rebbe did not declare it as a holiday. The free of the killer. So our Rebbe then said that but for Chesidim, the day of Gimel Tammuz is even more important than Yud Beis Tammuz. Than Beis Yud Gimel Tammuz. Because for Chesidim, the most important thing is the presence of the Rebbe. And, as, and, and the fact that the Rebbe's life was spared, this is the greatest, this is the most significant element. This is the point I want to speak about. This is the point of the melech of a king. What is the significance of a melech? And we know that in Torah, in Yiddishkeit, for the Jewish people, the melech was of the utmost importance, the greatest significance. Even today, we are waiting for the Giyula, for the redemption, but to us, redemption without Melech HaMashiach is not redemption. There are people who say, oh, that's a soil is in, is in Jewish hands, and we have a Jewish government in that soil. That's redemption. And we say that's not redemption. That's still Golas in the full sense of the word. Surely, surely it is, it, uh, you know, the Jewish people there, and they have to be secured, and, and they have to be protected, and it's absolutely a, the biggest mitzvah to protect them. But this has nothing to do with the ultimate redemption that Hashem has promised us. Ultimate redemption has to do, as the Rambam explains, describes, the union of Mashiach, of a Melech HaMashiach, a king. And as the Rebbe pointed out in this explanation of Gimel Tammuz, that to us, Chesidim, the most important thing is that the Rebbe is alive. Whether he is meeting with us, or he's seeing him or not, that's of secondary importance. I'm sorry? I'm saying that Tachsidim is the most important thing is that the Rebbe is, is there. Whether or not they can communicate with him directly is, is of a secondary importance. This was by the free of the Rebbe. This is what the Rebbe said. Gimel Thomas, Tachsidim was even more important than, than the days of Gimel Thomas. And I want to discuss this principle. What is so significant about the Melech, especially with the American mindset? Who needs a king? Democracy, right? 
democracy is the blessing of the world, the blessing of this country. The country this country, you know, this, the democratic system that it created really brought tremendous blessing for all its citizens and for the whole world, in fact. And there was no Jewish survival, a, 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 a Jewish development and growth in the history of the world the way it occurred here in this country. Because of the, the fact that despite all the shortcomings, it is still um, um, the greatest system and it really provides enormous opportunity, enormous freedom for every individual. And Yiddishkeit has, has blossomed over here over a, such a short period of time. You probably don't even, be, you can't even believe how short a time. In a period of 50 years, the entire country is flooded with yeshivas and, and communities and so forth. It really is an amazing thing. So who needs a king? The king was a dictator, a monarch, that's why people rebelled against the monarch, against the king, because the king was unjust. And we, even, are waiting impatiently for their coming a king for the Jewish people. I want to try and get us a little bit of a handle and understanding what what's behind us. The first principle to understand from a Jewish perspective the very first principle is that the primary importance of, in a, um, by a person, by he, is the recognition of the godly presence in the world. It is absolutely important that he be honest and truthful and be a good person and learn and daven and be a scholar and be a thinker and love your fellow Jews and so forth. All of these are of extreme importance. 613 mitzvahs. But the, the overall significance of all that just like the word mitzvah and we discuss this many times the word mitzvah means a command a command has to have a commander a mitzvah is not a good deed and a good thing a mitzvah means a command and the ultimate value and power of the mitzvah, the ultimate reason that mitzvahs are so significant to us, is that they represent the commander. That through mitzvahs we become, we rep we become connected. And we're following through and bringing the, the presence, of, presence of the commander into our midst, into the world. This is what a mitzvah is. This is the most important element in Jewish life. What is the most important thing that Ayit says every day? Shema Yisrael Hashem Akim Hashem Achot. You say a whole bunch of different things. 
you learn in your dad and so forth. But Shema Yisrael, this is the, this is the center. This is the central thing. And we would like to focus in and try to understand what is so central about this. What does an Abraham need so much that he should be recognized? Is he really such a Balgaiba? I mean, really, he feels so short of recognition. He needs constant, constant recognition, constant praise. What's in it? So, the truth is that to discuss this thing in definitively with all its ramifications so that we can have some kind of a grasp really would require much more than, than, than a session and then two sessions. I'm going to give us a little bit of a, an analogy. An analogy means? Analogy. No, yeah. Analogy. What does it mean that you have a king? A king. What? No, what does it mean to have a king? We have spoken before I pointed out the following view, the following scenario. Many, several times I've been pointed out that when Hashem created the world, He created a very big, rich world with enormous amount of variety all kinds of beasts, of animals, of fish, fowl, fowl means birds, vegetation, the sun and the moon and the stars, all the constellations, the entire, the entire planetary system, the whole world, a huge, complicated and complex world. And all that was created in five and a half days, as the third relates, from Bracius till, till Thursday, till, till Friday afternoon, five and a half days. Now, I would like each one of us to focus in and think for a moment. Personally, we all human beings, we all have intelligence and Hashem blessed us with it. We can only all, all value, evaluate the value of something. Think of this big world with all that's going on in it without a human being. No humans. You understand my question? Yes, sir, I like it. Okay. It's a smile, right? It's a joke. Think of the world, and it's a big, you know, everything is going on. Winter and summer and spring and fall. No humans. What do you think of that proposition? What's the world about? It's just cycles and things dying and things being Would you born. say that it's pointless? Well, to me, because I'm a human, I guess it is. Oh, there you have it. <laughs> you are contaminated. 
I'm asking from you, human intelligence. There's no greater intelligence in the world than that of the human being. That we agree on, right? From your human intelligence. And human intelligence is very valid because it's a godly blessing. God bestowed this human his intelligence upon us. From your human intelligence, what is the world without the human being? Right? Yeah. Zero. Then, yes. I'm sorry? Why did the Jazzy create Jews? Why did he just create Jews? What else would you like to know, my dear friend? <laughs> Let, let's take, let's try to understand as we go through whatever, if, if, if there's a pertinent question, believe me, discussions of this nature are endless. I just want to get to a point. So this, I mean, my point is that each one of us it has, has this intelligence to recognize that the world has to have a point. And the world without a human being has no point. And then we go and put the human being into the world. And all of a sudden, everything changes color. And it does have a point. And it has a meaning. What happened? How did the human being change that that dire perspective originally? What happened? Purpose. What does it mean, purpose? Go ahead. Well, most you open open the, to the audience. Well, most humans are living like animals, so, <laughs> so, how, so how can we say that it's That's changed? right. No, no. So that, that what you're saying is correct. That means that most humans would not answer the question, but some do. And I'm asking for those some that do, what, do they, what effect do they have on the world? What is, the, what is their effect? How is that changing? So I just want to very briefly discuss this thing, because I'd like that we should understand, we should all be participants. Would you say that the fact that a human being has invented cars, that makes it, gives the world a point? Okay, I see the smiles. No, it's nothing to it. What about cell phones? But he made life so much easier. We can talk across the globe. Nothing to it. It's still within the globe, within the world. There's nothing there. In other words, I mean, we can go on and on and point out all kinds of things. In other words, what we all, just for these couple of questions, it is not a question of developing the world that made the, the difference. What made the difference? The fact that the human being is aware and he represents something higher than the world. That's what the human being is. He represents something higher than the human being. Only the human being has the intelligence to recognize that the world has no point, if not for this something higher. You could not ask this question to a cat or even to a um, dolphin <laughs> or a fox. <laughs> doesn't exist. People are running around without heads these days. They're losing, they're losing their sleep. Look at this. this, this fish is so smart, this bird is so smart. What's going to be with the human being? Come on, you, you know, you're blind. This the, is nothing. The phone is smart. And the phone is smart, but the computer is smart. Smartphone. 
literally, I, I remember when the computers first came out, people were going without a heads. You know, a computer is going to displace the human being. We are, we are, we are you know, I don't want to use the derogatory terms, to, um, but it is this, the, the silliest thing to say. Only a human being is blessed with intelligence, exclusively. They may have smarts, they can figure out things, this is not, this is not intelligence. intelligence. To understand value, truth from not truth, is exclusively a human factor. And what, how did the, humans, the presence of human being in the world change the entire scene and gave it a value? Oh, this, this is a real world, it has to be spared, it has to be built on. It is his consciousness and his recognition that there is something higher than the world that comes to the world. That, practically speaking, does not change the world at all. Practically speaking, he's still living in the world. He still have to eat and drink and sleep. He still have to use his cell phones. He has to use your cars. Practically speaking, it doesn't change anything. But it's changing the perspective, changes the value, the purpose. What's it all about? What is going on? What is the world? What is the world represent? So I want to give you a simple analysis. Essentially, I would speak about a traffic light. Somebody some of you have already been exposed to this analysis on three different levels. On the animalistic level, on the human level, and on the soul level, on the godly level. You're driving a car and the light becomes red. And you say, sucks. Who needs that red light? Right? It's interfering with my, with my movement. I really, I feel like break, going right through it. But I may have an accident. Or if I don't have an accident, if I'm scared of an accident, a policeman may notice me or give me a ticket. They give me points on my, on my license. I'm not going to do it. But I'm really frustrated about it. But I have no choice but to, but to obey it. Gentlemen, this is a behemoth. This is a behemoth. You know what a behemoth is? Animal. This is, a, this is the, the animal in the human being. This is called Nefesh Abans. He is smart enough to know that you have to stop at a red light. But he, but he, he is just involved in himself. The red light is a nuisance to him, but he has no choice but to obey it. Then there is another human being who thinks more like a human being. As a human being, he is aware that the very fact that he has a car, the very fact that there is this paved road, this beautiful chaussee, beautiful road, that he can drive at 60, 70, 80 miles per hour, was not built because he is driving a car. It was built because there are thousands of people who have to drive cars. And if he were not part of the human society, these roads wouldn't be there. These cars wouldn't be there. He would be walking on gravel, pulling his donkey. So therefore, when it comes to the red light, he recognizes, you know, this is the only way things can work. It's not that he, you know, of course, sometimes he gets frustrated because he, he's, he's late at the, to a meeting, late to, a, to catch a plane, whatever it is, but he's respectful. He knows that this is the way it has to be. 
he doesn't feel attacked, he doesn't feel like, uh, that it's against him, it's for him. Right? He's part, it's part, part of the, he's benefiting from it just like everybody else. There has to be a traffic light so that traffic should be able to flow smoothly and secure in safety. And that is for his benefit as well as everybody else's. Okay? That's a human view. When he understands that he's not, that he's part of a human race, and he understands that, that um, nothing happens in isolation. In isolation. No person lives in isolation. You live in, in a society and uh, with other people. And the only thing, the only way that, that can happen is, is if you have these rules. And it is beneficial for everyone. As like I said, there would be no cars if there weren't society. There will be no paved roads if there weren't um, social establishments. Now all of this is within a simple worldly um, uh, logic. Right? This is a general. Now there's a third view. I'd like you to think with me in this third view. This is coming from a completely different perspective. The third view is the recognition that everything that's going on in the world, it is not about me or about you or about everybody else. There is something of a greater, like we said, of a greater significance. This entire development in the world represents the greatness of God. So it's, there is a, there's a greater significance to this. And therefore, when I see there are thousands of people moving across the road, going in every direction, as a result of that, we need all kinds of traffic lights in order to facilitate this greatness that's going on in the world. What does that make you think of? Makes you think of your personal gain or your personal safety or it makes you think of the greatness of the Creator. Look what's going on. This is a completely different perspective. This perspective, because there is in the human being, some human beings, the capability of having that perspective, this is why the world was created. This is why the human being justifies the creation of the world. This is how he changes the entire perspective. This is represented by the presence of a king. King is the epitome. Epitome means the 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 supreme representation of the human greatness, of the human perception. <coughs> and for us, Eden, Eden are those uh, people who were blessed with that perception, with that recognition. As a matter of fact, the Gemara says, 
The Gemara says, Chayav Adam Leima Bishvili Nibra Ho'ilu. A person is obligated to say, Bishvili Nibra Ho'ilu, the world was created for my sake. For me. What does that mean for me? Not for my, for, for my selfish needs. What it means is that a person has to judge himself and say, okay, here's a whole world, no humans. And then I was put into the world. Does that change the perspective of the world? Uh, changing. Does this bring any, any reality to the world, any value to the world? It is important to recognize that, yes, every individual need changes the entire perspective of the world. Because his duty, his function, is to recognize this truth. To recognize that the entire development of the world, that's, that's pointless. But the fact that it represents the great, the king, the greatness of the, of the, of the creator, that is what this is all about. And I and you and each Eid has that insight, has that capacity, has that, that method. This is what I said before, the Amuna. This, this is what, what Ayin is. Now, as I said originally, this perception does not change anything functionally, functionally, practically, in the world. Everything goes on the same way, exactly. Like I have the example of the traffic light. The traffic light operates whether you have a behema attitude towards it, whether you have a human attitude to it, or you have a godly attitude to it. It's exactly, it works exactly the same way. But it changes its significance. It changes the oil, the light, the, the meaning of it. And thereby it brings real significance, real life into the world, into the general world in, uh, in general, and to every individual need and to every, the Jewish people. This ultimate reality, this ultimate truth, this is what the king, the Jewish king, represents. What is a king? A king is not an engineer. He is not a, a, an expert on commerce. He is not an expert on, on agriculture. He is not, he does not provide any functional or practical services. What does he provide? He provides the, the, the recognition of what the world is about and what life is about. And thereby, he, by, by the people relating to him, having a king, they are elevated to to this significant level of life, to the reality of life. This is why the Giula, what we are waiting for, the Giula, the redemption, it's not a question of being redeemed that we should, Baruch Hashem, like everybody says, in this country, look at this. We, we, can, we can do anything we want. Who is infringing? Who is bothering anybody? There is no subjugation. You have equal rights. If somebody if, um, uh, um, uh, offends you, you they can take him to court, or whatever it is. That's not what redemption means. Redemption means to be redeemed from the from being sunk into the world, into the meaningless and pointless life, and to be elevated and to, to the point, to, to a life 
that is truly Jewish, that is truly significant. And this is what the, the king is. This is what the Rambam says, that when Ma'ala HaMashiach will ultimately be revealed, the very last pieces in the Rambam, in the Rambam's book, he says, what's going to be? There will be no other concerns. The only concern that people will have, the only strive, 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 you know what strive is? Have interest, pursuit. You have it now? Will be to know Hashem. To know Hashem. And in our discussion, we can understand what this is about. To know Hashem, to know that truth that is above the, the insignificance of the world. To know a, a, true, a, a, a truth of, of existence. This is what we spoke of before I even started this, 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 this today's topic. The Indian and uh, the Muna, this is something which does not change. It is interesting that by David HaMelech, David HaMelech, till this day, David HaMelech was approximately 3,000 years ago. Approximately, a little bit less. And to this day, we say David HaMelech, David HaMelech, so Chai What does that mean, Chai This is what we said before. A worldly element does not have the, 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 the permanence quality. It is here today and gone tomorrow. It doesn't have that godly quality of, of eternity, of permanence. What has permanence? Only godliness. The Melech of the, Jew, the Jewish Melech, the Melech of Malchus of of, a, of, 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 of Am Israel. The Malchus, I said, what is the Jewish people represent? This represents that which, which makes the world a real presence, a real existence. And I said, worthwhile to be created, which brings the godliness into the world. The Melech is what represents that that element in perfection. That cannot dissipate. That cannot dissipate. That doesn't die. Because truth does not die. This is not a worldly element. This is a godly element. This is the significance of what the Rebbe said about the Fiji Kereb. The Rebbe said that the fear of the the fact that the fear of the life was spared, this is more important to us than anything else. Because his very life represented the, 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 the truth of the Jewish people. <coughs> Just to know that he is there, that is sufficient. We don't, whether we see him, we don't see him, we have benefit of, of contact, that contact, that's secondary. That is what makes things real. In translation to that and bringing it back to, to Gimel Thomas as it has as it has uh, 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 resulted, so to speak, in our own days. 
this is the Gimel Tanus that, that we cannot possibly relate to, possibly accept, possibly understand. Nevertheless, we do understand that it cannot possibly change this principal reality. Because the principal reality cannot dissipate. So this, in a nutshell, you know what a nutshell is? You know what a nutshell? You know what a nutshell is? A nutshell. No, not that. A nutshell. A shell of a nut. You know what a nut? A little nut. A nutshell. This in a very small point, the small container, is the point, the point of the Jewish people, the point of the Jewish Melech, the point of the Rebbe, the Rabbein, and the point of we say that the Rebbe is still with us. Because this is what makes the world worth, worthy of existence. as we have discussed before. And we're all sitting, we're all wishing everyone, the entire Jewish world, the entire world, and, and uh, anticipating uh, impatiently, but, but with sure, with, with with, with a Muna, with absolute confidence, with absolute steadfastness, that, in fact, that, in fact, it will be restored in a, in a, in a factual and an obvious way. With God's help so that the health of the whole world and the purpose of the whole world will, will become obvious. Instead of going around in circles, you know, like groping through the dark. And I want to wish each one of us and each one on every yid, we should stay steadfast, should not lose as we saw them, one moment of, of, of um, assuredness, of confidence that the reality is there and that the Melech is there and whether we see him or not, the Melech is there because without that there is nothing. And maybe she's here that ultimately it will come to fruition and it will become the Gilui and the Ram says and then we will all we will all um, the, the whole world will be revived to, to appreciate and to benefit from this, from, this, uh, from this great truth that allows and gives the world a, a justification for existence. Instead of fish chasing fish. Okay. So... Surah Stavis, have a good day, and we're all going to Pabrengi in the 7th day, I presume. And that's here. <coughs> yeah. Some people make that the whole world. Make that the whole world. Bird, animals, this, that. It's an amazing thing. <laughs> it's a beautiful bird. No question about it. What? 
I have no blood. Of course it's for you. But what does it tell you? So that's that's it. That that this is the this is where a beautiful bird or a beautiful world it, it, it has to to us. It reminds us of the greatness of the Creator. Without that, it's nothing. Imagine, imagine if you really believe that this bird had evolved from a cockroach. Look, it looks like a cockroach. It has a cockroach color. <laughs> well, what's in it? It is the 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 fact that it represents a godly element. This is what gives us its significance, and this is what we are here for. But why 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 are we? Why does it appeal to us so much? Like to see a rainbow or a waterfall or a beautiful landscape. You know why does why? it appeal to us? You know why? Like intrinsically. I'm explaining to you. I'm explaining to you. The reason it does is, in fact, this is this is where the we have the disconnect a little bit. In our souls, we know the truth. And this is why when we see the thing, we see, it, we see a truth. But we have a disconnect. When it comes down to our conscious mind, we say, oh, this is war. But it's not. It really is not. We dare not kind of connect it all, but this is physical. It's not. You know, and this is what happened, that they came up with a new theory. Oh, it's evolved. That's, this destroyed everything. This is not true. Because we say it. It's beautiful because we say it. I'm sorry? We say it's beautiful because we say it. It would not be beautiful if, if, if there would there not, not be a human being. It wouldn't be beautiful if there would be no human being. Well, that's, that's yeah, I'm saying, but it appeals to us. Why does a human being see it? Because a human being has a godly quality. Okay. has a godly quality. This is why he thinks he sees it. I mean, there's so much to speak about. Like I said, we have a muna. We have a steadfast view of reality. Why? Because we're aware that there is something very steady, very real in the, in, in the world. Why? Because we're aware of something being in support of the creation rather than just the world as it flows from day to day. Something is supporting it, something real. That's what a moon is. Hmm? Okay, so let me, let me say this. I, I, it, it's, a, it's a big question, it's a valid question, it deserves a discussion, and I'm not going to answer it on one foot. I just want to say one thing. The world... Thank you. The world as a whole is representative of its creator. Hashem, as we, we learned, and those who learned in the class, that there is the will to create the world. Hashem wanted to, uh, to that, that the world should have all the greatness that he that he can give it. And then on top of that, on top of that, through Torah and Mitzvahs, we have we have the Pneumius and the source of all that. And the full meaning of, of all of that. Should we be swayed You know, the, there's a famous marshal, I just want to uh, limit it. There's a famous marshal. A person 
um, was given the opportunity to go and visit the king. And a king resides in a palace. The palace is a huge edifice. And, it, and it, there are many different stages. There is the external vestibule and then the internal vestibule and so forth and so on. The king himself resides in the inner chamber. The path towards the chamber of the king is very colorful. And it, and it contains much, much interest, you know, like everybody visit the Louvre in Paris? The Louvre, right? You know the Louvre? The Louvre, okay. It's, it's a king's palace, and it's full of art, very interesting art. It's a very rich, you know, and the, the building itself is like a, like a, bigger than Macy's, like a, a square block. It's a huge building. Many floors. So as a person is walking through and if he's got any sensitivity and he sees all of that beautiful art, he is distracted by the art. And he spends a lifetime studying the art and never reaching the king. <laughs> he doesn't understand. But this is all, this is the external chambers. What is this all about? This is all about the, the, the king himself. Don't be a fool. Don't be, you know, yes, it, it, it's beautiful, but, but that's, it's, it, this is attracting, so to speak, your, your talent, your appreciation. It's not attracting your real essence. The king is, is that which, which elevates your real essence. So, so uh, this is, yeah, the Rebbe created a beautiful world. And yes, we have to appreciate it. As a matter of fact, there are brochas. There are brochas that you have to make. You see a new bloom, you see, you see um, unusual animals, you see make a bracha. Yes. But what is this thing? What is it? Why do you make a bracha? That you immediately say, "Oh wow! Look at the, uh, the 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 artfulness of our Creator." But if you start worshiping the Creator, the 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 so to speak the the animal, you lose you lose you completely misplacing your attention. I remember as a kid, there was a yid. Um, not needs to describe it, but the yid was a very. He didn't really know too much of of, of a depth and and and, uh, and what what's going on. So in those days, this was at the time when the, the film that we have, this new big film with the boxes, with the colorful boxes, the first were first introduced what was coming out. So somebody got one of these big films with the box, with a, a double box and that covers over. You, you, you've never seen anything else, you know, but the, the, this was a novelty, you know, about 50 years ago. So they showed him the film. So he picks up the film, then he picks up the box. Says, <laughs> he, he was taken up by the box. <laughs> it's not a good feel. Wait, the cover and box is a, is a, is a novelty? Is a new thing? Yes. <laughs> the double box, sure. A, yeah, yeah, no, no, they have a box. They are just a, a box that covered the, 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 the top, not, not the entire <coughs> structure. And it wasn't so colorful, whatever it was. So he picked up the box. So when you look at this, you're picking up the box. <laughs> Instead of the life, that's in it. I explained to you just in the beginning. A muna is wonderful, but you have to understand a muna is exists because because there is a life behind it. 
people, I, I always say, people should make a mistake. A Muna, people say Muna is blind faith. God forbid to say that. A Muna is the most brightest insight that a person can possibly have. If he recognizes that, this is, this is what's given, that he recognizes the, the support, the source where it's coming from. This is the real source of life. So, we should help from that. Um, um, yes, we should utilize the day of Gimel Tammuz, and the Rebbe should help from that. Ultimately, uh, we should see the final result of all our faith and all our confidence. It should be materialized in, in the pale mamash. Amen. Right, this is it.